Hi everybody, Mr. Record here. The purpose of this video here is to address an issue that um, a lot of my incoming AP Calculus students have and to also take care of some topics that, that would occur in my college algebra class that I teach at Avon High School. And that's dealing with the definition of absolute value. And from this, we're going to work a couple of examples. So, first of all, when we talk about this formal definition of absolute value, it's important that we realize that it is going to manifest itself into what we call a piecewise function. So you're all familiar with piecewise function notation. And we would say that the absolute value of x would actually take on two different kinds of values. Well, the first value is just the value that's inside of the absolute value symbols, x. Nothing changes. Whatever value you originally saw within the absolute value symbols is the value that it spits out as long as x was either positive or zero to begin with. And that probably makes sense. You've been trained to understand that the absolute value of a positive 6 is still going to be positive 6. The absolute value of 0 is going to still be 0. Where things change is when the condition of the x is negative. If x were already a negative value, so you have to picture that there is a negative number sitting here inside those absolute value symbols. Then the value takes on the opposite of that x. And occasionally I'll have students that kind of raise their hands and say, no, 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 that can't be right. That can't be right. Because you're talking about this negative x right here. That can't be. Absolute value of x can't be a negative number. Well, it's not. If you take a very close look at this guy right here, he is indeed positive because x already has a negative value in it. The negative of that negative will turn into a positive. So if you memorize this particular definition, it's going to be very simple to apply it in a variety of formats. And my first little example that I wanted to do here, um, this actually comes off of the summer packet that I have for my incoming calculus students. Um, I'll just kind of note that here so that you can find it if you're watching this topic three. Problem number one, where the function is y is equal to the absolute value of 2x minus 4. And to, to sort of save some time, I'm not going to write the directions. I'm going to go ahead and recite them. And it just simply says, write the following absolute value equation as a piecewise equation. And we are also going to want to simplify that a bit. So what do we do? Well, again, we just go back and we use this formal definition of absolute value. So in our particular example here, we would say the absolute value of 2x minus 4 would break apart into a piecewise function, where the top piece would just maintain the value that's inside the absolute value. In this case, the 2x minus 4. Nothing changes. But that's only going to be true as long as what's in the absolute value was positive or zero. Now, I want to caution you, one of the biggest mistakes that I see students wanting to make is just utilizing uh, the quantity x greater than or equal to zero for this condition right here. You know, they see x greater than or equal to zero in the formal definition of absolute value. Why don't we use that here? Well, you got to keep in mind that our x is no longer simply an x. It's now a 2x minus 4 quantity. All right? For our bottom piece of the function, we'll take the opposite of the quantity. I'm going to go ahead and rank those in parentheses so that I remember to distribute that negative sign. And that's going to be true as long as 2x minus 4 is less than 0. Now, typically speaking, you'll want to go ahead and simplify this. This is not very difficult to do. In fact, for the top piece, there's nothing to do. And then for the, uh, the, the domain restriction inequality, you'll want to solve this for x, and I think we can probably do that in one step here. If we add 4 to the right side and divide by 2, so we come up with x greater than or equal to 2. And then for the bottom piece, we can go ahead and distribute the negative. And once again, solving for the x, we would have x less than positive 2. And this would be your final answer. Um, this could be graphed on a calculator. I'm going to spare the details in doing that. It's something very easy for you guys to do in just about any graphing calculator. But what you'll uh, basically notice is that the V-shape that
that we are typically used to seeing an absolute value take on is going to be formed by these two lines. One line will have a slope of 2, the other line will have a slope of negative 2. They'll meet at a certain vertex value, and that will make that particular V shape. Now, my next example is going to be a little bit more challenging for those of you who do use the summer packet. I'm now looking at topic 4. Uh, we're going to go to example 1 here. Topic 4, for those of you who don't know what it's actually called, soft inequalities, quadratic inequalities. But example 1, the directions are, again, write the following absolute value equation as a piecewise equation, but you'll notice now that we do indeed have a quadratic within the absolute value sign. So we're going to do the exact same approach that we did before. We would say that the absolute value of this x squared minus 1 would break apart and become x squared minus 1 as long as x squared minus 1 is positive or 0, or it would be the opposite of x squared minus 1 whenever x squared minus 1 is negative or less than 0. Now, the challenge for these quadratic type of inequalities uh, values is, as I said, is these quadratic inequalities that we have to solve. They're just a little bit more trickier to take care of, but nothing that you can do. So, let's go ahead and do this. For the actual functions themselves on, on the left side, uh, very simple, you know, we'll go ahead and keep the top part the same and just the negative and bottom part. Now, for the inequality, you'll notice here that both of these inequalities consists of the x squared minus 1 component. So what we could do is just kind of focus on that guy a little bit, and we'll notice that this one is a very uh, sort of user-friendly type of quadratic in that it will factor. Now the ones that don't factor are a little bit more challenging, and yes, you might have to use the quadratic formula and you're dealing with quadratic values, but typically speaking, in problems in this kind of an application, the quadratic typically will factor nicely. And you can see that, you know, if, if we were to set this equal to zero, if that were our focus, we would have values of, of one and negative one. That would be um, true for the x. But notice this is not an equation. We're talking about inequalities here. So the best way to take care of this, in my opinion, other instructors might be uh, advising you to do some things differently, but I think the best way to handle something like this is to set up the number line and place the two values, negative 1 and 1, that you came up with, um, kind of put them in the correct order. And then just choose some test values. Now, what do I mean by that? Test values. Well, pick a value that lies to the left of negative 1, and uh, I guess negative infinity would be the boundary on that side. So, you know, something like negative 2. Negative 2 would work fine. That'll be our test. Between negative 1 and 1, we're going to test 0. And between 1 and positive infinity, we'll test 2. Now you might ask, where do we test those? Well, we're going to put those particular values in that x squared minus 1 function. Like x squared minus 1. And it's not the absolute value, but just the quantity x squared minus 1. So we're going to evaluate that essentially at x equaling negative 2, 0, and see, hopefully you can understand that notation. It's just saying y is equal to x squared minus 1 such that x takes on these three values. And the answers that I would get in order would be, well, negative 2 squared minus 1 would of course be positive 5, and 0 squared minus 1 of course is negative 1. 2 squared minus 1 is also, uh, you know what, <laughs> maybe that's not right, so let's go back. 2 squared, negative 2 squared minus 1, let's get that right, that would be 3. Yeah, I was thinking plus 1, but that's minus 1. 0 squared minus 1, now that is negative 1, I had that right. 2 squared minus 1 is also a positive 3. Okay, now you'll notice that it's really the sign of these guys that is important. What is the sign? Well, 3 obviously is a positive, so we can say 
that along that particular interval where we chose to test negative 2, our result in the x squared minus 1 expression is always going to be a positive. Likewise, between negative 1 and 1, we're going to get a negative. And between 2 and infinity, we're going to get a positive. So what does that say about adjusting our particular um, domain restriction? Well, let's see. Uh, move that down straight. I'm going to move that guy over so I don't get that single room to the right. Basically what that's saying is, if we were to go back and, and take a good look at our first domain restriction, the x squared minus 1 greater than or equal to 0, we want to say, okay, well, when is that true? When is x squared minus 1 greater than or equal to 0? Well, we'll find out that that's also the same thing as saying, when is x squared minus 1 essentially positive? And we notice that we've got a couple of intervals when that happens. It happens to, on the interval negative infinity to negative 2, and it happens on the interval 2 to infinity. Now, we'll notice that because of the equal, or the underlying, we will go ahead and include negative 2 and positive 2 in that solution. So basically what we could say here for this domain is that our function, absolute value of x squared minus 1, will be what we've got right here, x squared minus 1. It'll take on that value as long as x is less than or equal to negative 2 or when x is greater than or equal to positive 2. Very important, we want to use the word or there because if we use the word and, it really doesn't make sense. Anybody else have speak of a number that's less than negative 2 and at the same time greater than positive 2? Okay, so let me get that number line that I've written down and get some of fraction. So we've got x squared minus 1 here in the end. And then for the denominator, or the denominator, for the bottom piece of the function, you can probably guess. Hmm, when is the x squared minus 1 here? Oh, this guy less than 0. Well, that's going to occur when we have a negative value, and lo and behold, that happens to occur on this interval between negative 1 and positive 1. And I think the best way to write that would be sort of as a compound inequality. I'm sure you've seen this in your math classes, where you could say negative 1 is less than x is less than positive 1. Notice here we will not underline the inequality because the 1 and the negative 1 will not be included. And that's your final piecewise function solution for the absolute value of x squared minus 1. Hopefully this helps.